Okay, hey friends, this is Dan and Stephanie Burke. You're watching Behind the Scenes Divine Intimacy Radio. Stephanie is back from a brief hiatus from the show. Welcome hey. Back. So I had uh, our friend um, Terry Rumor talking about Fraternus. He's a great guy. Sorry I missed guy. him. He yeah. has a beautiful wife and family. That's a wonderful um, tool for priests uh, to build brotherhood and, and connection and virtue in their parishes. Um, so if you missed that show, check Fa it out. Fathers and sons. Fathers and sons, yeah. Fathers and sons yep. really should uh, look into Fraternus and tell their priests about it and see if they can start a chapter at their parish it's somewhere the, in their diocese. I think it's fraternus.net, if I remember. Okay. To net, I think. Anyway, so today, a few things before we jump into the show with Dr. Kevin Vost. Again, he's, he's, a, he's a very... Uh, He's an excellent author, writer, communicator, and so we're always happy to have him back, and he's with us often. So today we're going to be talking about death, uh, judgment, heaven, and hell, the last four things. But before we do that, there are a couple of events coming up. Webinar tonight. Is it tonight? It is tonight. Holy Eucharist and Reverence with uh, Father Altier, who's quite famous online, I think, or developing. So. A wonderful holy, humble priest. He's but it, wonderful, but, but he is quite Also renowned. clear yes. and hard-hitting, Yes, but not uh, angry, rigid, hard-hitting. No, and, and <laughs> when you talk to him or listen one-on-one, I mean, -on -one, um, as, as it'll come through on the webinar, I'm certain, um, I, I just think he's extraordinary. Yeah, he's so Holy Eucharist and Reverence tonight at, um, at uh, doesn't say the time, but uh, spiritualdirection.com forward slash events. I think it's seven central is my guess when it'll okay. be. So, we'll find out from the producer lady. She'll let you know. Yeah. The next event, the mental prayer, why we need it now more than ever. Church of All Saints at St. Hedwig, Hedwig in Holding Ford, Minnesota. That's a hard city to <laughs> name. September 23rd, 7 p.m. So I'll be there. And that's also spiritual. These are free events, by the way. Uh, SpiritualDirection.com events. And then Waconia, Minnesota, I'll be there, will be there September 26th, 1 p.m., the winery at Sovereign Estate. And I'm told it's a beautiful winery, and that's an Into the Deep event. So all of those can be, that's on uh, Finding Peace Through Prayer. That's uh, all at SpiritualDirection.com forward slash events. That's a, Half day retreat on September 26th. Yes, and your webinar tonight is at 7 p.m. Central. 7 p.m. Perfect. Yeah, make sure you register so you can get the link. Yeah, you have to register for it, even though it's free. Um, last two things introduction to St. Therese at the Avila Institute. Deacon Colin Coleman, if you want to hear a guy with a very interesting accent, teach a class and actually teach you good stuff. He's from New Zealand. And he's part of the community Beatitudes. He's a very good teacher, and he loves St. Therese. So that course starts September 13th. And the last one is Growth in Holiness and the Doctors of the Interior Life. Doctors, of course, are doctors of the church, like John of the Cross, Therese, Teresa of Avila, um, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, Mac, St. Maximus the Confessor, St. Isaac the Syrian. If you want to learn about them, um, September 14th is that course, Dr. Michael Gamma, who's amazing too. So uh, I wish I had time to take all these courses from our own school. That would be cool. Me too. <laughs> yeah, me too. You too. So go out to avala-institute.org, avala-institute.org for the event, spiritualdirection.com, and then click on the events tab. So I think we better, I think we're ready to get rolling. You ready? I'm ready. Okay. On your mark, get set. This is Dan and Stephanie Burke with Divine Intimacy Radio, your radio haven of rest. Your hermitage of the heart. Your monastery of the mind where we lift our hearts and minds to heaven to help us navigate in the storm of life, the challenges of life, and help us really to come to an understanding of how we can live in joy and peace in the midst of the storm. Because Jesus is actually awake in the boat, I think. What do you think? I think so. I, I mean, think, I don't I think all he was those pretending. No, all those situations are um, trials. They're you know, 
Do you believe? Oh, you right. have little faith. You know? Right. So. Right. Very good. Yeah. So we have a returning guest, one of our favorite writers, authors, speakers. He was at our last summit, which was very a lot of fun to have him there. Um, who is that? That is Dr. Kevin Vost, and he obtained his doctorate in clinical psychology from Alder University in Chicago. And Adler, taught- I think. Adler, 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 okay, <laughs> forgive me, I'm not from Chicago, and has taught psychology and gerontology at the University of Illinois at Springfield and Aquinas, Aquinas College in Nashville, Tennessee. A revert to Catholicism, yay, revert, um, after 25 years of atheism, Kevin has written over 20 Catholic books from Memorize the Faith to Aquinas on the last on the Four Last Things. The father of two sons and grandfather of three children. He lives with his wife, Kathy, in Springfield, Illinois. Welcome, Dr. Vost. Welcome, Kevin. It's great to see you. Great to see you again, uh, Dan and Stephanie. It's my pleasure to be joining you from my study of studiousness, uh, at least sometimes. <laughs> great. <laughs> well, we really enjoyed having you at the Avila Summit this year and getting to know you a little bit. That was a blast. Um, for folks who are wondering about the summit, it's an annual gathering uh, where we bring speakers on a specific topic. And um, we were, it was fire from above. And Dr. Bose did a talk on the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the fruits, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he's written a book about that, of course. And it's, a, it's also a very good book. Uh, today, we're talking about his book, um, Aquinas and the, last, and the Four Last Things, on the Four Last Things. And um, so, uh, Dr. Bose, let's just jump in. What are the four last things? Sure. Uh, there are four things that we're going to deal with one day. Uh, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Sounds pretty ominous. So we're all sle- uh, we're all going to experience at least, I guess, three of those. Death, judgment, heaven, or right, at least three. That's right. That's right. You know, uh, I, I, I find the... Old, old statuary or paintings of saints and things like that. Fascinating because they often have a skull uh, either in their hand or on their writing table or whatever. Does that relate to um, the last four things in this topic? It, it sure does. You know, there's an old Latin phrase to memento mori. Remember that we're going to die. Mm-hmm. And in some of the, the scriptural writing, the book of Sirach and others says, you know, if you really, if we think about this, if we keep in mind that we are going to die someday, it would totally change the way we live our lives. We would abhor sin, you know. So, so yes, that's a crucial factor there. It's the unescapable. St. Thomas More said, even for, for unbelievers, that fact of death is inescapable. It's there. It's there for us all. Uh, and it should revitalize uh, the way we live if we keep that undeniable fact in mind. One of the one of my favorite photos of all time, which may sound a little strange because they're so replete today. We have so many photos and visual images everywhere. But there's this black and white photo of a of a Carmelite nun. And for those on radio, if you can visualize this, you're in her cell and she's facing away from you, so you can't see her face. But she's kneeling beside her little, very, you know, simple bed, and her arms raised up very high left and right arm raised up like as in praising in her habit. And one day I was looking at the photo and on the right, it had a crucifix on her wall and on the bottom of the crucifix was an actual skull. And I think uh, the practice back then was that those were the skulls of the deceased members of the order, that sort of thing. But they took this very seriously back then. And I think it's waned. I think in our time, we you know we 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 like to use uh, colloquialisms and different ways of talking about death to hide the severity or the or the challenging nature of death. But um, the book you've written here, and of course the reflections of Aquinas, are are to try to help us recover a healthy look toward that uh, time when when it's all done and our judgment's done. Absolutely. You know, these are the, the last things. And sometimes St. Thomas likes to use philosophical terminology like, like ends or goals. And all these things come at the end. That's where we're ultimately headed. And it's those goals, those ends should order then how we live our life to make sure we can achieve that end that we want, that eternal bliss in heaven. 
you know, rather than the suffering of hell, and as we'll probably get into in a bit, and, and hope, ideally so we can avoid as much as possible the, the temporary sufferings of purgatory. So yeah, keeping these in mind, you know, should be vital, you know, vital to every follower of Christ because, you know, we want to be with him one day. And by, by keeping these uh, concepts in mind, by understanding them uh, better, it's going to increase, increase our chances that we are going to enjoy that bliss with God someday. And in the good Lord willing, we're going to help others get there too. Uh, even now on earth, we can help others who are in purgatory by our acts of prayers, offering masses, and so far and so forth. So when we when we look deeply at these four last things, it ties into all kinds of vast teachings from the church. You know, not only the eschatology, the end times, and the nature of the four last things, but it also has all kinds of moral lessons on how we live our lives every day of our life here on earth. Absolutely. So, so you mentioned purgatory, and so obviously we're most of us here listening online, or or certainly us in here in the in this conversation um, understand that there is a purgatory. So do is there any chance that so, that souls go immediately to hell or heaven? Is there some sort of um, holding room? Do we have conversations before where we meet our ultimate judgment? What does Thomas Aquinas say on what happens to us at the moment of our death and then um, to our basically our judgment. Yeah, that's an extremely important question. And I should note, that, and Thomas, in his book, I, I cover 164 questions in total that, that he covers regarding these four last things. And for some of the questions, some of the answers are definitive doctrines. Dog is taught by the church. So, so we can know with confidence this is the way it is. Others are more speculative. There's opinions there. It's not been clearly revealed. We can argue uh, one way or the other. But the existence of purgatory is a very fundamental uh, Catholic teaching. And Thomas teaches, one of the statements at the beginning is, whoever denies purgatory, really in a sense they deny the justice of God, because it is set up for us in a totally uh, just manner. Now, so in his first article I cover, where, where he addresses purgatory, he talks about different opinions that developed over time within the church. Uh, like what happens to us right after we die? And he said, some people thought, well, well, nothing. Nothing is going to happen until Christ comes again. You know, at, that, at the end of time, then our souls will go where they're destined and so on. And Thomas, you know, taught, no, the church teaches something different for very important reasons. One, the moment that we die, there is a particular judgment where you and I will be judged our, as an individual human being you know, based upon our own acts, whether we still, we die with grace in our souls connected to God or not, or whether there's some stains of, of uh, venial sins on our soul or not, or whether there's mortal sin. And depending on the state of our soul at that moment of our death, at this time of this unique judgment for you and I, our souls will go either to heaven, if there's no stain of sin on them, to hell, if there's grievous mortal sin on our souls, or perhaps for the majority of us, to, to purgatory, the state where we would go if we do not have mortal sin on our soul at the time we die, yet we have committed some venial sins, some, some lesser sins that we haven't made satisfaction for, that we haven't you know, done our penance, kind of paid our dues, or if we've had mortal sins that we have confessed, they're no longer going to drag us to hell, but maybe we haven't done our penance or satisfaction for those yet. Purgatory is a time that God provides for us after death where we can undergo this additional cleansing, so our souls will one day uh, uh, reach heaven after this cleansing of purgatory. And we read in Revelation that nothing uh, unclean will enter heaven. So purgatory is this opportunity for our souls to become cleansed, to become purified. So every soul in purgatory will at one point attain heaven because they have died without that mortal sin that drags us down. And without going on too much longer, I'm going to give a very nice analogy that, that St. Thomas Aquinas gives us for this. The state of our souls, not our body and soul, that's something a story that comes later, but the state of our souls after we die. He said it's like the effect of gravity on objects. If you have an object that's lighter than air, like helium or something, so that's kind of like the soul that dies without any stain of sin on it, and it's going to rise immediately to heaven. So like the saints, the martyrs, their souls are going immediately to heaven. Now, if you have a soul that is mired in heavy deadly, unrepented mortal sin, you're going to sink. You're going to sink down to hell. Uh, but in the middle there, if your soul is, is uh, 
does have some things weighing it down, but not the mortal sins, then you will rise to heaven, but you're going to rise slowly. And sometimes I like to think of it, and later he actually does use an analogy of a balloon. Like if you ever see people in those movies, they're stuck in a hot air balloon, they start to sink, so they have to throw everything over the sides to lighten their load to make them to, to make them rise. And in a sense, purgatory can be looked at that way. We're cleansing, purging, burning off those sins that will one day allow our souls to rise to heaven. So, so just, I guess, to make a long story short, yes, the church does teach that when we die, there is instantly a judgment that will determine whether our soul is going to go at the moment of death, uh, either immediately to heaven or hell or uh, to purgatory. That's really beautiful. You know, it fills me with hope. It should fill us with hope that the Lord uh, provides this opportunity to cleanse us so that we can stand before him, um, even if we have uh, stains or, or things that are weighing us down, as you said. You know, it reminds me of a dream my mother had when my grandmother passed. She was in the States, and I'll say it quickly before we go to break. Um, but it was so beautiful. I, my mother, my grandmother was very beloved, you know, uh, 13 children, a beautiful woman. And when she passed, my mother fell asleep in her sorrow and, and had cried herself to sleep. And in her dream, she heard the phone ringing and the phone was actually ringing, but she didn't answer it. And so, but in her dream, she heard the phone ringing. She answered it in her dream. And my grandmother was on the other end of the line. And the and my grandmother, uh, she said, um, "Mamita, are you okay? You know, um, Mamita, are you okay?" And she said, "Yes, I'm okay." And my mother, in her dream, said to her, "Have you seen him yet?" And she responded, "I haven't seen him, but we can hear him." Hmm. And that just really consoled me, and I found it to be incredibly beautiful. So purgatory is a mercy of God so that he can cleanse us and bring us into his presence when we're ready. Amen. So beautiful. Mm, so when we beautiful. get back from the break, we'll continue talking to Dr. Kevin Vost on Aquinas on the four last things. We'll be right back. So 1244, we'll just go to 13. Uh, you mark Get set, go. This is Dan and Stephanie Burke. Welcome back to Divine Intimacy Radio, your radio haven of rest. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me do that again. <clears throat> Welcome back. This is Dan and Stephanie Burke, Divine Intimacy Radio. We're talking to Dr. Kevin Vost, who's written a, a stack of books, that, and you should read every one of them, <laughs> but there's a few that I really like. This one is really amazing. Aquinas on the Four Last Things. And just as a, a side note, so oftentimes when we're heading into Lent, we're not really ready for Lent. Uh, I always recommend folks practice the preconciliar uh, traditions of Lent, like Septuagesima and those times of preparation. When you do that, or when you start getting ready, ready ahead of time, you can get the reading material you need beforehand. So I'd strongly recommend, depending on when you hear this broadcast or you hear it uh, a recording or whatever, that you pick up Aquinas on the on the four last things and you mark it at very least to read before Lent and then during Lent. It, it's quite a it's quite a it's quite a good uh, thick book, so it's over two hundred pages for today's standards anyway. Uh, but I think you'll be deeply blessed by it. It'll help draw your heart and mind to the to the to the uh, a proper state for the season. But also, it's also traditional in the church to reflect in the last four things before Advent as well, because it helps us to understand uh, why he came and uh, was born among us incarnate. Uh, so Aquinas on the four last things. So before the break, we were talking about purgatory. Stephanie relayed the beautiful story of her grandmother. Interesting thing, Dr. Vost, is a lot of people shy away from the discussion of hell in our time, and some, I think, in a very incredibly destructive way uh, seem to imply that there is no nobody's in hell which of course isn't true uh, in the Council of Trent you know some recent controversy about a prominent Catholic apologist saying that we don't know if Judas is in hell and the Council of Trent of course puts him there so we have magisterial certainty that that he Judas is in hell but with respect to talking about hell with people, my sister, God rest her soul, died in her mid-30s. She was my closest sibling. Her name was Linda. 
And I was wrestling then, I wasn't a Christian, but I was wrestling with the concept of heaven and hell. And I talked with her about hell and it actually scared the hell out of her. And I mean that literally, I'm not being crass in my, my speech. And she came to Christ uh, mm. before she died mm. because she began to think about these things. We often don't realize that God is involved in these conversations, right? And so oh, yes. this book, I think, is not only a book that I think will help people understand the doctrine, it's a book that will help them to meditate on these truths and 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 hopefully amend their lives and orient more fully to God. But it's also a book that can help us evangelize by telling people the truth about heaven and hell. Does that uh, does that ring true to you? Oh, absolutely. That that is so well put. Important points made there. That. Uh, the, it's important to know, to think about the reality of heaven. What would heaven be like as far as what the clues we've been given? What would hell be like? Because they're, they're going to be reality for us at some point in time, one or the other. Uh, and when I laid out this book, you know, following St. Thomas's guidelines for the section on heaven, I put, you know, heaven uh, for those who accept it because God is offering heaven to all of us. You know, he, he gives us his graces. If we've been baptized, we, we join with him. We're one with him in charity. And then if we sin grievously, he's given us, methods of confessing, of repenting, of rejoining him in grace. So he has designed us to be with him in heaven one day if we cooperate with him. Uh, for the section on hell, I could title that hell for those who choose it, because to get to hell, it's not going to happen accidentally. Uh, it's going to involve, you know, deliberate misuse of your will, rejecting, God, rejecting God's offer. He's got this, you know, engraved invitation to all of us. If we're not going to make it there to heaven, it's because we will have uh, rejected him, keeping in mind that, that God is just uh, unlimited, unlimitedlessly uh, uh, merciful. And we mentioned Judas Iscariot, and it called to mind a story uh, I recall from St. Catherine of Siena uh, in her dialogues where she had ecstatic uh, visions where God spoke to her. And in, in one, uh, God referenced Judas Iscariot, and he told her that, that Judas's greatest sin uh, was not the betrayal of Jesus Christ, but after that, even to think that God would not forgive him, to think mm. that God's mercy was limitless. The idea being that God would have been totally willing to forgive Judas Iscariot if he would have fully repented in heart for what he had done. So God's mercy, you know, is virtually limitless, but we have to cooperate with it. We have to ask for it. We have to join with him. So, yeah, these issues of heaven and hell, you know, I think, are, are extreme importance to focus on uh, their, their reality and on the importance of trying to comport our will to God. So, so we'll end up where he wants us to be. Wow, that's so important, especially today. And, I, you know, you just look across and you see so many people suffering in their pain and their shame and their brokenness. And I think if you could get to the core of it, it would be that they don't think God can forgive them. And, and we really need to help people understand that he is just extraordinary and he's so merciful. So you mentioned in your book, um, particular and general judgments. Can you explain to us why we need to understand that? What is it? What does that mean? Sure. Yeah. And that is very really essential. The church has, you know, taught about this for, for millennia now that that particular judgment, as we referenced earlier, when each one of us dies as an individual human being, we are going to be judged, you know, the state of our souls at that time. And then our soul will go heaven, hell, or, or purgatory, where our bodies, you know, remain in the earth. Uh, so here, as St. Thomas says, we are judged as individual persons, you know, based upon our own uh, merits or lack thereof. But then this general judgment, this is what comes at the end of time, when, when Christ uh, returns for the final judgment. And now Thomas says, now we're going to be judged not as individual human beings, but as members of humanity, as humanity as a whole. We are all going to experience this judgment, uh, even though, you know, where we go, the particular judgments uh, will determine, you know, where we're going to end up. But, but it's all going to become clear to everyone on the earth at the same time when Christ comes. Then after this judgment, the general judgment, that is when our bodies are going to be reunited with our souls for the rest of eternity. So this is a very, very crucial teaching that, you know, God crafted human beings as beings of body and soul. He made angels as, as pure spirits, uh, the lower animals on earth as, as bodies alone without an immaterial soul. But he gave human beings this what's called intellectual soul with intellect, with will, 
and it's immaterial. It's indestructible outside of an act of annihilation from God. So our souls are going to persist forever in heaven, but God also crafted us as in souled beings. He gave us bodies. We're not going to become angels forever in heaven. We are actually going to have uh, bodies, but they're going to be glorified, perfected human bodies. And, and some of the church fathers and St. Thomas have talked in very amazing and beautiful ways about some of the things, some of the hints we've been given about what these glorified bodies are going to be like. Yeah, that leads to the next question, which is what are the rewards uh, that God holds for us in heaven, both body and soul? I personally am looking forward to turning this one in and getting a new version uh, uh, because mine has not worked very well for most of my life. So what what's that all about? Well, you know, in, in a very real sense, that is very, very really true. Mm -hmm. uh, building on, you know, different different hints in the scriptures. And one of the, the biggest foundations is 1 Corinthians 15, I think 42 to 44, where St. Paul says, uh, what the body that is sown perishable will be raised imperishable. Sown in weakness is going to be raised in power. Sown in dishonor is going to be raised in honor. It was uh, formed as a physical body. It's going to be raised as a spiritual body. And from this verse and others, uh, St. Thomas talks about four major characteristics of a glorified body uh, as uh, impassibility, subtlety, clarity, and agility. But before I dip into those, I should say, too, that, uh, that the teaching is our bodies will be perfected in heaven. So if you had some, some well, one thing that, that they're all going to be brought back around the ideal age, and it's usually speculated to be in our early 30s there, you know, where Christ came into heaven. Uh, so these ancient church fathers are talking about that physical perfection around the age of 30. And as I was writing about this, I thought just for fun, I Googled on the Internet, you know, when we reach our peak athletic performance, both in strength and endurance. And it, it really is around the age of 30. So Thomas said that we're all going to come back with bodies like at that peak, at that peak of our physical uh, perfections. He said we won't come back as children because children have not yet attained their physical peak. We won't come back with an elderly body, though because we will revere and respect the elderly even in heaven. It's because of their soul, because of their wisdom, not their body. So even the elderly will come back with uh, this ideal body. And if we had some kind of major defect, like some growth disorder that prevented our body from getting its naturally desirable size or becoming you know, too large with deformities, those kind of things will be remedied. So, so we're going to be giving perfected bodies. But these four things, and I'll, I'll talk about them very briefly, then if you want to expand, you know, we can if there's time or not. But, but basically this idea of impassibility, uh, one thing it means imperishable. You know, the bodies we have now, you know, we decay as we grow older and then, and then we die. But these new glorified bodies, there's, there'll be no decay. They won't decompose. Also, another key and interesting component here is we know our bodies on earth, sometimes our passions, our desires, you know, our lusts, our anger are very hard for us to control through our reason, but our, our glorified bodies will perfectly obey our, our reason. So we won't have all these, there'll be no, there'll be no sin, there'll be no sinful desires. So an amazing thing to think about, uh, the, the subtlety of the, the body. We think the way when Christ came back with his glorified body, he walked through walls and things. Well, the idea is that our bodies will be able to follow our will and just move, move as we uh, want them to move. Now, they won't be pure spirits because, as St. Paul said, we'll have a spiritual body. So they have spirit-like qualities, though they'll still be bodies, but just have amazing capacities there. Clarity is one that I really, really love. Um, this is the idea that our bodies will, sown in dishonor, raised in glory, our bodies will be beautiful in some amazing ways. They'll actually glow, will we'll emit this light. And uh, when I was doing some research on this, it occurred to me, you know, there are these deep sea creatures that get no light from the sun, but they generate their own light. It's called bioluminescence. And actually scientists find that we all do that. Even human beings now, chemical reactions in our body actually emit light, but it's so faint we can't begin to see it. But in heaven, we're gonna glow with the visible light in these glorified bodies. Uh, the other is uh, agility that I, I say, put it in superhero terms where we're going to be faster than the flash. Our bodies will be instantly be able to move. Well, not instantly, but, but faster than we can perceive. We'll be able to move where we want to go. So in a sense, I say God's going to make us all, you know, glorified athletes in Christ. Our bodies will totally obey our souls and our bodies will be given all the perfections they can possibly get, be given as human beings. So one thing a lot of people don't know about you is you're a weightlifter. 
And uh, my, what I want to know is, will I be able to lift as much weight as you in heaven? <laughs> oh, that's a good. Uh, hoping to God that we both get there, we can we can test that out someday. All right. That, well, let's let's make it a point right now that we're gonna we're gonna test that out. I'm also looking for like an eternal ping pong game where you know nobody, nobody, nobody misses and all that. But anyway, we're running out of time. This has been fun talking about this with you, uh, Doctor Vos Aquinas on the four last things, of course, published by Sophia Institute Press. You can find that out at EWTN's religious catalog. You can find it at uh, our um, our uh, shop button on spiritualdirection.com. Make sure you head out to spiritualdirection.com. And uh, Dr. Bose, thank you so much so much for being with us. Oh, it's always my pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Now we, um, so we have to. We thank lost. you so much. It was awesome. Yeah, Dr. it was a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, thank I, you so I am so hopeful. I'm so excited for our glorified uh, body. You just uh, uh, um, brought me great we, joy. So <laughs> right. Stephanie's got to record the ending. I've got to record the ending thank card thank here. Yeah. So uh, go ahead, Steph. Okay. God bless you, brother. So our time is up. Until next time, may the God of peace make you perfect in holiness. May he preserve you whole and entire, spirit, soul, and body, irreproachable at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. Awesome. Well,